Hey, hey, this is Carlos. I'm the founder and CEO at Product School. And today I'm here with Caitlin Quinlan, who is the general manager at Gainsight. Hey, Caitlin. Hi, Carlos. Thanks for having me. Good to have you on the show. Love having people from your company, um, like CEO Nick. Um, and I want to continue digging deeper into the conversation because you guys are building something really cool with, that has an interesting angle that connects customer experience, customer success with, with product. I haven't seen too much of that yet. So, But before we get into that, I also want to learn more about you. Um, general manager, that's a, that's a big title. So how did you get started? Yeah, so... Um... I, I, I've been saying for years, like, let me give you the abridged version of my background. <laughs> I feel like as the years go on, it just gets longer and longer. So I'll do my best to keep it um, short. But I will go back to the beginning. Um, I started my career on the East Coast in financial services, doing something completely different, um, investment due diligence for private equity companies and VC clients. Um, and I noticed in 2009, 2010, there was like a huge shift on the deals that we were working on and everything was software. So concurrently, my partner, Matt, and I moved back to California and he was going to get his MBA and I just started to get the FOMO of Silicon Valley startup life. Um, so as I looked around, you know, at, at those clients, private equity companies, like what are they investing in? And to me, like one factor emerged to be very prominent, which is, if I'm going to go to a company, I really need to believe in the product and the custom, the company's success is going to lie in that durable value of their product. Um, so I made a jump to an operating role at a, what was then a startup of MongoDB. <laughs> um, and far and away, like the coolest thing for me was going from financial services where everyone had my same job and same role. And we were all kind of doing the same work to working across all the functions with completely different disciplines. And it was my first time ever working in the weeds with product and engineering and sales leaders. Um, so now in total, I've been at four software companies, um, uh, MongoDB, Mixpanel, Nova, which was a spin out of DreamWorks, and then arrived at Gainsight where I am now, um, and had done throughout that time pushing um, to learn more about each part of it organization's function. Um, so I've ha held various roles across the functions and um, leadership teams, um, which have led me to my now current position, which is the GM for the PX product line at Gainsight. So for those of you that don't know, PX is um, what product and customer success leaders use to create the best possible experience for their customers in their software. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll just have to make a quick plug for um, on product school. We do have our micro certification for product led growth using PX. So check it out. <laughs> yes. Um, I was also looking at your LinkedIn profile. I saw you had seven, no, nine different roles at Gainsight. And that's really, <laughs> really cool. <laughs> well, first of all, even before that, it's not a very, very, it's not that a lot of investors turn operators. I've seen a lot of operators turn investors. So that's definitely like a, an interesting move. But then once you turn operator, you've been wearing so many different hats before you became a general manager. So maybe you can guide us a little more through that journey, especially at, at Gainsight. Yeah, totally. So I joined Gainsight um focused on sales strategy and operations, which is a role I'd held at a mixed panel prior. Um, and I think what drove the sort of like multiple roles and uh, moving to different parts of the organization was one, of course, curiosity, but a lot of it was following the customer journey. So I started out really focused on just sales. And then um, as like the classic go-to-market story, there was so much of a relationship to marketing that it quickly bridged to be like, okay, it's not just sales analytics strategy. It's got to include marketing and marketing ops and that stuff. So it becomes revenue operations. And then, of course, Gainsight, um, you know, is very focused on like the customer and the customer journey. So, okay, well, you can't really just think about pre-sales. So then you've got to look at what happens after you close the deal and soon adding in CS analytics and strategy. Um, and putting this strategy together so that all of the functions are operating in the same way on the same cadence and executing on the same plan can really make or break the success of a, a product line. Um, and so that's where I started to pick up other things. Like I, I 
started focusing on the strategy per, in particular for just the one product in PX because I was like, okay, I can follow decision making. The way that Nick phrased it to me was, I need to know that when one team makes a decision in one function, there's somebody that cares about the results everywhere else in the organization. And so just sort of built up from there until uh, I found myself here running this product line. I mean, the way I, I've seen your your career evolve within Gainsight is similar to the way I've seen product-led companies evolve. They typically started with a more of a sales-led approach. And at some point, they started looking at, okay, but what drives the sale? And it's typically an excellent product experience. And and then eventually, it's like, okay, but what is driving an excellent product experience? Well, this is actually engagement and the usage. The users need to love it first. Right, and that creating that motion obviously leads to to sales. But it's been in, it's been interesting, and I haven't seen many sales leaders that are able to kind of branch out of sales to start getting a bigger scope for for an entire business unit. Yeah, um, I think you're so right. I you know I, for a long time, I think a lot of people thought as of PLG as um, just sort of like a freemium conversion from a free trial. And it was very new business focused and like very just on the, the marketing or pre-sales side. Um, but it's been so true for me and especially like learning at Gainsight as the company has grown that a lot of PLG is focused on your post-sale, what your users are using in your product and how they achieve their outcomes and grow with your product and find more parts of it. And then as your company grows and becomes multi-product, that's what I call like the second funnel after the sale for cross sell and expansion. Your product is both the most effective and the most efficient version of selling that secondary product. And if you optimize the experience with good digital engagement, that is going to be the way that your customers interact and grow with you. And in in a way, your your product is very meta because one of the first movers or the evangelist in, in product-led growth, at the same time, you're building a product for, for product people. So, so what is your, your day-to-day as a general manager? Yeah, um, so sort of like zooming back out, um, as the GM of PX, I'm responsible for setting the strategy of the product line. So this guides how our go-to-market, um, our teams go to market with PX, but and it's, you know, that sounds like it's just from the sales and marketing perspective, but it's also about the roadmap for PX and how it's set and maintained with product and engineering. Um, so a lot of my day to day can be unblocking decisions or managing, you know, sort of like escalated, how do we address this new thing that's come up. Um, but basically, it's like I was sort of saying, keeping all the functions aligned around the same strategy so that we're operating towards our goals and the most effectively that we can. Um, and, and, you know, do spend a, a fair amount of time with customers and prospects, understand their firsthand feedback and experiences, which to your point on PX being very meta, just sets the bar really high <laughs> for how our own um, experience of in-app engagements and how people self through, serve through a knowledge, knowledge base, um, just how they interact with our product and how they make that journey easy. Um, because I, I like to say, no matter how hard you try and no matter how many human connections you make by default, your product is the most contact that your users and customers have with your company. So it's got to be a good experience. So as a GM, do you own um, profit and losses? Um, so, yeah, so there's a, um, I'm mostly focused on the growth of the product line, which is just the nature of the cycle that it's in. But I spend a fair amount of time looking at our full P&L, so profit and loss statement, um, for just that product line. So we cool. definitely balance, like as we think about where we'll grow, we're balancing how the cogs line up to that, um, for sure. It's a sure. little bit, you'll have to tell me, it's, a, it's my first sort of almost scratching the surface of what it's like to be um, a CEO running a, a, a mini company within a company. Well, I was just going to say, you know, like a lot of people used to define the role of a product manager as a mini CEO. And 
kind of disagree. Um, actually, I think a GM is more <laughs> like, a, like a CEO, mini CEO in a way, like you are the CEO of a specific business unit. Uh, I've seen a lot of product leaders become GMs. And usually the difference is that at some uh, at the GM level, you own PNL. Product leaders don't typically you own it, but I'm also curious to know how is your relationship with your with your product leader? How do you divide and conquer? Yeah, extremely close, and and not just one product leader, but the whole like set of product leaders. Um, it's one. I think uh, it's just important to make sure that the strategy is aligned with the roadmap. So in this case, um, Maxim Oksyanikov is um, our product leader. And so his team owns like the full roadmap, right? But the way that we prioritize what gets built and what we work on is through like a really collaborative relationship with my my role and the other general managers. Um, so which is great, because that allows us to really heavily influence the strategy, but always be operating in the same way. And there's continual sort of check in. So based on this development that happened, how does that influence or not influence that a change in our in our strategy? And I'll say that I think working with um, people who are product managers or product leaders is is really helpful in this role just because the GM role tends to be extremely cross-functional and you have a lot of stakeholders and there's probably not a lot of other roles in the organization that from the very first level, you're uh, starting out with so many stakeholders across the business like a PM has. I mean, like the PMs in the audience can tell me, like, do you have loud stakeholders that all want different things? <laughs> and how does that, how do you reconcile what everybody wants? I feel like that's a very similar skill set. So it's always really great to be um, collaborating with that team. It sounds very similar. I always say it's it's really a mindset more than a specific title. And in, in your case, like just as a very high level, like what is the status of, of the company? How, how big are, are you guys? How many products do you do you have? Yeah. Um, so I uh, lead the product experience product line, but overall, Gainsight is a platform with uh, three primary products and growing. Um, so we have our uh, customer success product, our digital hub, and then product experience, which all sit within a platform to have a cohesive customer experience. Um, uh, yeah, suite of products. Is that what you meant, or did you have yes, that additional so now, surprising? <laughs> all right, so the follow-up question is, okay, so you have a platform product that is supporting uh, additional products. So uh, I'm just thinking about your roadmaps and your interactions with the different product leaders. Like, as you think about growth, um, how do you ensure that there is some consistency uh, to just to make sure that the, the way you are growing your different product lines uh, is, is, is uh, under a specific strategy? Yeah. Um, so I think we have some structural things in place. And then for me, I have some sort of like methodology or approach things that are in place. So structurally, um, each of the GMs, we work really closely together to make sure that we have an aligned prioritization. We understand based on how the business is doing and where the business is investing and growing, where do all of our um, product roadmap investments fit relative to each other. So we are very aligned. So when we have those conversations with product leaders, we're very in lockstep with what the rank and prioritization is. So it's very collaborative in that way and um, organized. But I think more than that, for me, the approach and methodology is what are the use cases that our customers are buying for? And more specifically, what are the outcomes they're trying to achieve? And how do those relate to not only my product, but also the other products? And for that, you have to look at the full suite of products, not just your own. Because a customer, when they come to you, is not buying one product in a silo alone without thinking that everything else is disconnected. They think, I have this goal and this problem. I think you, Gainsight, can solve it for me. And I don't care which product does it. I have just a problem and you just need to solve it. So when you think about the answer to that, it's more about the use case than it is the individual product. So that's sort of another way I try to stay aligned to make sure that I put myself in the customer's shoes. So it's more about the use case than the individual product. I agree. Because at the end of the day, that use case goes across different products in, in some situations. And, and one thing that I've seen in a product world as it evolved like i started 10 years ago and w when did gainsight start by the way 
Oh, that's going to test my knowledge. I believe it's 2012, maybe a little bit earlier. So over 10 years. And we've had a, a couple lifetimes and had a different name before. So <laughs> it's, been, it's been a while. So it's been a while. And, you know, but back in the day, there wasn't that much um, awareness around the role of product. Or, or customer success, and, and you guys have been at the intersection of it. I've, I've seen different uh, products that are also um, serving product managers that take different angles, right? Like it uh, could be analytics, it could be road mapping, it could be prototyping. And I've seen uh, games that evolve kind of from the, pro- the customer success, but that now connecting with other functions such as products. So I'll, I'll be curious to know what are some of those key use cases that you've seen that can go across both customer success as well as product. Yeah. Um, so maybe calling out the three big ones that are like top of mind a ton these days. Um, so I, usage data or product telemetry in a health score to predict the per- like performance of that customer and whether they're, not, they're going to renew or not. Um, so I think a lot of people right now, especially given the economy, would like, you know, um, a crystal ball of where are all their customers going to be? How happy are they? Are they going to renew with me and, you know, have a hundred percent knowledge, which is great. I think one key input to that is how are your, you know, end users using your individual features and the stickiest features and are they completing the different paths in your product that make them realize value? So one big one is how you marry product usage with health scores and the prediction of like, retained ARR and growth and uh, net retention. And another one that has come up a lot is digital led onboarding. So you have this great product that's just been sold to a customer, you need them to onboard. A lot of that can be done manually in trainings, but that is not how we as users are trained on our iPhones today. It needs to be really intuitive in the product. And so I think that's something where CS has a huge investment um, in making sure that the customer onboards and has a good experience, but the product can bring a huge amount of that, like guiding the user through, sending them in-app guides that say, hey, we've noticed that you did this, or we know that your role is this, so we know you're going to use the software in this way. Let me give you a tip on how to, you know, move forward in learning this product. Um, And then maybe coupled with that, the third one would be, um, self-serve is, is really big right now. And so um, is you think about a user and, and I like to, my the example I like to use, which maybe will resonate with you. When you think about self-serve, it's not like I regular user have a help ticket that I need to log and whatever. It's like, think about the executive using your product, which is the person you most want to be in there. It's like the CEO of the other company, but it's Thursday night at 8.30 p.m. And they have a question and they don't want to bother somebody on the team who will probably know the answer, but you want to keep them in the software because they've just logged in. They're doing something great. You want to keep them in there. If you have like a knowledge center bot or you have a community that can answer their question right away so they keep moving in your product, that's super valuable. So those are things that are company level strategies or their customer success strategies as well as product strategies that do those use cases really marry nicely together. And I definitely need to, to, to double click on customer success piece because for the longest time, it's been treated as a second class citizen, right? Like sales, uh, marketing, engineering product would get usually more visibility and resources. And then you have this, you used to have this team in the corner where like really having a ton of value, keeping the lights on, trying to, to make sure that our clients are getting uh, value from our product. And now they're definitely being elevated. They're really getting an AC at the table. We're seeing more companies that are appointing chief customer officers. That's, that's huge. Like I was literally celebrating that a few years ago when I saw more and more companies appointing chief product officer. I think that's all news now. And I see the next wave of chief, chief customer officers. So I, I'm curious for your perspective, like what are you seeing and how is that relationship between a, C, a chief customer officer with a CPO to make sure that they are also getting enough partnership. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, it's funny. I go back to my uh, original uh, work that I did in my very first job. And I think about, because um, I'm very much a like math science person. And I think about the logic of like, why, why, why did the 
chief or there was no chief cup star maps or why were CS like a, had a smaller seat at the table or no seat at the table. And it didn't make sense to me because very quickly as you're growing as an organization, your customer base becomes way larger than your new business um, revenue that's being acquired. Like to the order of tens of millions or hundred millions of dollars, this number becomes their customer base becomes a lot larger. And I think that gets exacerbated in an economy right now where it's high customer acquisition costs to acquire new customers. And you sort of look at like, oh, where is our business? Oh, surprise, <laughs> you know, 80% of our business is recurring customer base. Um, and it really um, starts that conversation about where is your growth coming from? Well, it's actually coming from our customer base growing with our own products or cross selling to multiple products. And if you think of it from a product perspective, and you're thinking about where am I going to invest my time? And where am I going to invest my roadmap? Well, one of your biggest parts of your business is that closed loop feedback from customers putting in um, their product insights across maybe angry uh, NPS surveys. We've all had a couple of those. Um, but the uh, have if you if you put the dollars, purely the dollars in my brain, just because I, you know, way back in the day came from a finance background. It is a huge investment to focus on the customer side. So when you're thinking about as a product leader, you know, who are my stakeholders that I want to spend time with when I think about where I should invest time? Well, a whole bunch of your customers are under that CS part. And I think a lot of companies are seeing CS as way more revenue generating now than they did in the past. And as I had saying, I mean, there's a huge plug for your product being part of that revenue generating cycle. We like to call them product qualified leads, PQLs. PQL, definitely. I'm a huge believer in that. I, I think if anything, during this uh, complicated economic downturn, we're seeing how product-led growth is, is just not a tactic. It's really a company-wide strategy and, and leveraging existing customers can lead to more um, lifetime value because obviously you can renew those customers. Ideally, you can uh, upsell those customers. But on the other hand, those same customers can be leveraged to bring net new customers. And I think that is now in times where like you don't really have more budget for going out there and start just pumping ads or like getting net new customers, thinking inwards and, and realize that, oh my God, like the value is in-house and like it's more important than ever to, to treat our, our customers well. Um, it's becoming more of a profit center, profit center and I think it's elevating the conversation around why this team of customer success or even product deserves more investment than thinking of it as a just cost center because, of course, the sales team closed a deal and now we need to deliver something. Yeah, for sure. Um, I definitely have to ask you about AI because it's uh, oh. one of the hot topics, right, that is touching every single function of the organization. And so for your product, um, what, how are you thinking about potentially integrating or leveraging AI? Yeah. Um, so I think in general, um, like I'll be the first to admit that I, I certainly don't know everything about AI, but it's something that's so rapid growth. Like it's on my mind. So I'm, I'm trying to learn from smart people like, um, you know, uh, ex Amazon product leader, uh, Polly Allen and conviction founder VC Sarah Guo. So I'm like researching with, you know, content they're posting, but in general, I think, you know, when you think about the simplest answer is probably the best, um, where generative AI makes a lot of sense is displacing low value human activities. So I think right now where, you know, we're focused on is how can you take things that already exist in the product and then for ways that you would configure in the product, do have a generative AI start you on this. So if you, for example, in Gainsight um, across our platform, you can have a journey where you take the user through and you have engagement that you make with them based on the steps and actions that they're taking in your product. So one thing that we just announced at our conference two weeks ago is um, investing in how we can generate what I say, I want to create, for example, because I already used it, a digital led onboarding journey with engagements. So having it be the starting base um, and then tweaking it based on the things you know about your business. So it's really about like, how can I use it to like make all of the, my PMs and my um, admins of the software? How can I um, 
make their time more powerful, focused on the right activities versus the low value activities of starting something they've already done over and over again. One uh, use case I saw someone um, from Gainsa actually gave me gave me a, a demo, but it, it, it's really the um, the difference between going from data into insights. So for me, as I get access to uh, Gainsa, they have a lot of data points, and I, I can access the data, but then it takes effort for me to make sense of that data. So leveraging that AI to automatically give me those insights in a unified view, it's really really powerful, and and I like that these new LLMs, right, that are technically public and accessible for everybody can help. But I think there's a lot of value in connecting that with the in-house data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So another thing we're investing in is taking uh, product usage data or anything that you pulled out of your product data-wise and then uh, using AI to pull out the insights. And especially some, especially somebody who spent a lot of time in business operations, like you don't want to spend any of the time crunching the data and just getting to the answer. You want to give yourself as much of an advantage to be like, okay, this is what I learned. Now, how am I going to apply that forward to either inform my strategy, change it, um, compare it to other parts or, or, or double click and ask deeper questions. So it's definitely like you could, be quite a bit more efficient, but also it can take us into a much more rich conversation um, by taking some of those steps away. So super excited for that as well. And I think you're spot on. Uh, but now I, ca- I have kind of a, a um, challenging question for you because I heard from multiple people at Gainsight that takes pride in being a human first company and, and taking a, a type of approach. So how are you thinking about combining that, that human touch with the uh, superpowers? that someone can acquire by leveraging AI. Yeah, um, so for those of you that d- don't know, Gainsight um, focuses a lot on um, its purpose of um, winning in business while being human first. So really putting people at the center and um, you know understanding that first and foremost, we're humans before we're even employees or customers or end users. And so um, one, I think just keeping that focus in mind, it allows us to have much more empathy for what the user experience is going to be and keeping that in mind. But two, I think a lot of it is about, again, displacing low value activities to really take advantage of um, the human connection where it matters the most. So like, you don't want the people in your organization to do, for instance, like, really menial tasks like summarizing notes from a meeting they've had when they're doing um, uh, a user survey or or something that's going to inform the product roadmap. You'd rather have something take all of the data that was recorded on a call and summarize it for you so that you can then make the smart decisions beyond that. And I, I think that is both the efficiency and scale part of it, but I also think it's sort of where people end up focusing as far as personalization goes, because again, I think our standards of what we expect when we log into a software now are because of all the B2C consumer apps, they know me, they know so much about me. They they're targeting me based on like exactly whatever I've done and all of the history that they've aggregated. So when you lock into a B2B software, you better have at least a similar experience of like, please know what like role I am, why I'm logging in and also know what I've done in the product. And so if I've completed some steps, don't send me a pop-up that relates to something that I've already completed or already know. Or, you know, one example we like to use is if I'm logging in for the first time, don't tell me about a new release <laughs> because I clearly doesn't matter to me because this is just the new product. This is not a new release. This is just your product to me. And so I think keeping personalization um, at the center of that and is uh, is going to be really important. I agree. That's that's where I see a lot of opportunities for product managers to add value through new technologies such as AI, not as a way to replace the PM, but definitely like if someone can accelerate the creation of a PRD or simplify it in a way that can be easier to digest, if, if someone can help identify some of the different paths that can be created to provide a better experience for a new user versus an existing user, I take it. I, I don't. I think that's giving us superpowers. And, and of course, it still takes a, a human layer to edit and tweak 
the technology to make it more personal. Yeah. I um, I went to a, a product conference recently and somebody used the analogy, which I'm sure I won't get exactly right, but if you think about um, uh, humans and speed relative to all animals in the animal kingdom, we're like at best in the middle of the pack, but you put a human in a car or plane and now we're the fastest. So it's really about like that enablement of AI to just propel us forward in a way that we otherwise naturally couldn't, but still with that human layer. I think PRDs is a great example. Who wants to do the first draft? But of course it takes someone to go through it and be like, okay, the AI generated one doesn't doesn't quite get us there, but now I have something to work with. Well, yeah, Caitlin, I, I loved learning from you. Um, it's been a great time. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Carlos.